Good afternoon, frauders and sorors. Thank you for joining us for today's Wednesday teleconference. I'm really excited to be here with everyone today. And I hope that you enjoy this topic. I found it to be something that was really interesting to me and really a really inspiring topic. And so I hope that you will get to experience that and feel the same also today. So today we're going to be looking at a mystical topic, and I've chosen the topic of the divine fire. Today we're going to go through a few sections. So first I'm going to start out by describing a wake-up call, and then we'll look at the fire principle, and we'll talk about Martinez de Pasquale's text, and then look at some visions and revelations from Hildegard of Bingen. And then we'll end with a prayer and a musical reflection on that prayer. So I'd like to begin by asking a question. Have you ever heard your name being called when there's no one around? <laughs> this happens to me every now and then, and it's usually in my own voice, but I'm not saying it. And I hear it loudly and clearly, and it's just a voice saying my name. And it just says it once. And sometimes I hear this as I'm falling asleep or if I'm in a daydreaming state of consciousness. But whenever I hear it, it completely wakes me up. And it's just a voice that says, Sherry. And I think of this voice as a literal wake-up call, as if it's saying to me, wake up, pay attention, and remember who you are. And I think this is important to hear every now and then, because as we go through our lives and days, life seems to get more and more complex through time. And not only do we have family and life and work obligations to handle, but there are also the different layers of social pressure and effects from other world events. And our attention can start to get narrower and narrower. And then we tend to hunker down into our own worlds just to get things done. And there's always more stuff to do. And as we do more and more things, we can get lulled to sleep, even though we're still awake. And we sometimes can end up sleeping while we're just thinking that we're going through the day consciously, but we can easily drift into autopilot and not even know it sometimes. And then we hear that wake up voice, or you might have some other kind of wake up and remember experience. And it's this experience of hearing this call from a greater reality, in my interpretation, that led me to want to dive into the world of both of the figures that we'll look at today, Martinez de Pasquale and Hildegard of Bingen. Both were mystics and philosophers that developed different cosmologies or theological models of the divinity, the world, and humanity's place within it. And they both looked in depth at creation and the role of humanity within creation. And I've been especially intrigued by how they both deal with the principle of divine fire in their work. And so in thinking about listening to that voice that comes from some other part of our inner selves and thinking about it, calling the rest of our beings to really see and listen and remember who we are in the bigger spiritual reality we came from, connected me back to this topic. So in looking at fire, fire is a very special element. It's a material, if a material is combustible, then with fire, it could turn to ash. And if it's not combustible, it could get purified or does get purified. And the monographs talk about the importance of contacting the divine fire that animates our being and goes on to say that only spiritual fire can bring us regeneration. Now, in many traditions, we see that the world is birthed and sustained with this element of fire. And today we'll look at two different interpretations of this, one by Martinez de Pasquale and the other in the visions and theology of Hildegard of Bingen. And there are lessons in their work that still pertain to us today. So we'll start in the 18th century with Martinez de Pasquale. And he lived from 1727 to 1774. 
And his name might sound familiar to quite a few of you because he's one of the primary contributors to the teachings of Martinism. And we study his work in the traditional Martinist order. Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin, for whom Martinism is named, called Pasquale his first teacher and based many of his teachings on his interpretations of Pasquale's work, including the one we'll look at today, the treatise on the reintegration of being. Now, the treatise was written between 1770 and 1772, and Pasquale wrote it towards the end of his life. And it is a commentary on some books in the Bible, in the Old and New Testaments. And the sections we'll look at today reference the book of Genesis in the Old Testament and the book of John in the New Testament. And some of it also resembles some Gnostic texts based on the same sources. And Pasquale considers God to be the eternal creator and the source of life, and that all beings live only by the divine will. So in the treatise, Pasquale presents a model of the story of creation and the place of humanity and the divine. A key element of this text is his cosmology of the world, which is presented here in this diagram, which is called the universal picture. And this is an image from a copy of the drawing in the book. The part I'd like to focus on is called the central uncreated fire axis, highlighted here. In the next few slides, I'll go in depth on this image as we talk about the concepts that he's illustrating. Now, there's some parts of the illustration that I won't go into. So I won't talk about the circles in the middle of the drawing. Those are represented as the planets. That's, those are the circles in the dark middle area. But I will talk about the triangle at the bottom that represents Earth, the terrestrial world. So there's a creation story behind all this. So I'll tell you the story and we'll see how the divine fire operates. And as I'm going through this, keep in mind that all this language is symbolic and can be interpreted on many different levels. So in the eternal vastness, there was the divine immensity. And this divine immensity was populated by the creator, and the spiritual beings the creator emanated. And by emanated, I mean that these beings coexist eternally with the creator. They are not subject to time. Now, some of the spiritual beings inside the divine immensity decided to emanate on their own. They wanted to create their own spiritual beings and they wanted to have control over those spiritual beings. And these beings would not have free will. The creator, because of this, cast them out of the divine immensity and sent them to a place where their actions would be contained. So they're punished for misusing their ability to create. And being cast out, a goal was put upon them to reintegrate back into the spiritual wholeness of the divine immensity. Now, because of this, the creator asked other spiritual beings in the divine immensity to take on some other roles to help with the situation. And so the creator told these other spirits to command a space between the divine immensity and the space where the cast out misbehaving spirits were. And so in this diagram, the three orange circles represent the different groups of spirits holding this space. And they were in charge of keeping divine laws and rules. Now, the misbehaving spirits, being that their goal was to reintegrate back into the divine immensity, they needed help with this. And to assist with this, the divine creator emanated humanity, which existed only in spiritual form. So humanity joined the other beings and humanity is here represented by the yellow circle. And so humanity's role as purely spiritual beings was to help the cast out spirits reintegrate with the divine. And again here, 
humanity as being an emanation of the divine means that humanity was spiritual, eternal, and coexisting with the divine in timelessness. So humanity and the other spiritual beings existed in this area that Pasquale calls the super celestial immensity. And this is a world where only spiritual beings resided, but it is a realm that had time. So time is introduced. And then the creator had a group of beneficent spiritual beings create a new realm called universal creation. And this realm has matter, space, and time. And this is the physical world of creation. And part of creation is also what he calls the celestial immensity. And this consists of the stars and planets. And here we use the term creation. And creation is physical and temporary, and it's bound by space and time. So creation is different than being an emanation. So the creator had the group of beneficent spirits form a boundary. And that boundary is called the central uncreated fire axis. And it exists inside universal creation. So this is where the cast out misbehaving spirits reside. And this is their container. And this is called uncreated because the beneficent spirits that form this circle are eternal beings. And they are only performing this function. Remember that they were emanations from the divine. So the fire is not made of beings that are created, hence uncreated. They are not physical and they are not bound by time. I also think it's called uncreated because the fire is always consuming and nothing else can exist there. So to create the terrestrial world, and that is the white outline triangle at the bottom, the creator sent what Pasquale calls spiritus essences into creation. And these were the beginnings of matter, but they needed to be organized. They just existed in potentiality and they needed order and direction. So then the divine creator sent in the divine word, sometimes called the cosmic Christ, sometimes called the active and intelligent cause, and sometimes called the divine word or just the word or the capital W. So he sent the word into creation, and the word here is represented by the vertical line that goes from the terrestrial world all the way up to the celestial, super celestial immensity. And this is also a reference to the book of John, where he states, in the beginning was the word with a capital W, where the word refers to Christ coming into the world. So the introduction of the word was so massive that it created an explosion and the physical elements of fire, earth, and water were created from those spiritus essences of sulfur, salt, and mercury. So in the story, all matter in creation exists because of the word. So now the terrestrial world represented by the green triangle was fully created. And the central uncreated fire axis, portrayed as a circle, surrounds the terrestrial world <clears throat> and the heavens. And the spirits that compose the fire axis keep it burning. So we're always surrounded by this perpetual purifying fiery force. And Pasquale writes that this fire is the principle of life in all created bodies and holds in equilibrium all forms without which no being could have life or movement. And he also goes on to say that it is a fire that limits the vastness of the universe and the course of movement and action of every being within creation. 
So we can also talk about the sun here. You see in the diagram, the sun is the yellow circle in the middle. And remember, we also have the other planets and stars here in the celestial immensity. And the fire axis has a relationship with the sun and it's always destroying and purifying and sustaining life within the axis. So with regard to the sun, he says that in this universe, the sun is considered to be a superior star to all others because it most appropriately represents the uncreated fiery axis. And from this, we can say that the creator placed his tabernacle in the sun. So Pasquale says that the same spirits that compose the central fire axis also maintain equilibrium of the world and matter, space, and time. And he says that the word is considered the generator of creation, the underlying life-giving force of the universe. So creation exists because of the divine word, but the fire axis sustains that creation and keeps it in equilibrium. So there's also a place inside the fire axis called the terrestrial paradise, indicated by the green diamond shape. And in the terrestrial paradise resided Adam. Now here, Adam is the ideal primordial androgynous human. And Adam had a special glorified body with armor to help in this mission. Because his mission, his role as a human was to help guide the misbehaving spirits through their reconciliation so they could unite with the divine. So Adam had the power to be in touch with the spiritual beings and to create other beings with the consent of the creator. However, he was influenced by the misbehaving spirits and then decided to create his own being without the consent of the divine. The being that he created was purely material and not spiritual because it hadn't been co-created with the divine creator. So Adam failed and was punished for misusing his creative power. So Adam realized his mistake and he asked the creator to forgive him and to please give life to the other body. So Adam lost this glorified body that existed in paradise and he received a body of flesh and he was cast out of paradise down into the terrestrial world. And the rest of humanity had to go along too because this was seen as a collective act. So all of humanity were cast down into the terrestrial world, indicated down there by the yellow circle, now in the lower green triangle. So the creator gave life to the other body and the other body became Eve. And when new humans are born, we still get a bit of the divine spark from our spiritual beginnings in the super celestial immensity, but we have to look toward the divine light. And we also get perhaps the most important virtue possible, and that is love, but we'll come back to this. So in the text, the divine sent the cosmic Christ to express forgiveness for Adam and to play the role to teach humanity. Along with the misbehaving spirits, the new goal of humanity in a different place and time was now to reintegrate with the divine as well. So reintegration happens in multiple steps. We first must attain reconciliation. And in the words of Louis Claude de Saint Martin, this is attained through the assistance of the cosmic Christ. And in the introduction to the treatise, it is written that reconciliation is the preliminary stage that each person must cross in his or her evolution towards reintegration. Humanity's final stage of collective evolution. In this process, the person lives an important inner experience in which the Christ is met, according to Saint Martin. The Christ is in effect, the cosmic intermediary indispensable to the regenerative process. For this reason, the Martinist tradition speaks of Christ 
as a reconciler. And so in Martinism, we talk about how the world of creation and matter inside the central uncreated fire axis is important. It's important because it serves as a temple for the reconciliation of the lost spiritual beings and humanity. So reconciliation takes place inside the central uncreated fire axis. And reconciliation is an individual effort that we are responsible for pursuing. And as each human achieves reconciliation, we then go to occupy a special place in creation, still within the fire axis, but it's at the very top of the fire axis. And we stay there until all of humanity has completed reconciliation. And this waiting area at the top of celestial paradise is represented by the yellow circle at the top of the green diamond. And in Pasquale's cosmology, he considers this to be the position of Saturn. And to really strive toward reconciliation, we have to be awake and present in our lives because reconciliation can't just happen by accident. We have to work for it. And after all humans have achieved reconciliation, then all of humanity reintegrates back into the spiritual world of the super celestial immensity. And again, in the introduction to the treatise, reintegration is described as being to restore to a unified whole that which has been disintegrated or broken into parts. So reintegration is a collective ascension of all humanity. In Martinism, reconciliation and reintegration can be achieved through what we call the way of the heart. And Martinism is called often the way of the heart because through the teachings of Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin, he talks about how it's through the heart that we can work toward to achieve reconciliation and reintegration. And we study this in the traditional Martinist order. In Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin's writings and philosophy, he teaches about how the inner path and mystical prayer are tools for working with the intelligence of the heart. And he also says that the heart is a portal through which divine light circulates. And divine light is found when we look toward the divine immensity. And in Matthew chapter eight, verse chapter five, verse eight, it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So this brings us back to the gift of love that humanity receives from the divine. The central uncreated fire axis in being sustained by the group of beneficent spirits is in fact an axis sustained by love. And in the monographs, they talk about how love exerts an immense power of attraction between all beings. And so it's the love of all beings that helps guide us towards reconciliation, but it's also especially the love of the light. So in speaking of the love of the light, this is now our transition into Hildegard of Bingen. So with Hildegard, we'll go back to the 12th century. And Hildegard lived until the age of 81, which is very long for the 12th century. And she was what we would call today a polymath. So she's known as a mystic, a prophetess. Sometimes she was called the Sybil of the Rhine. She was a visionary, a composer of music, a physician and healer, and a theologian, among other things. And she lived her life as a Benedictine nun and abbess. And she was a Christian mystic who received visions and direct revelations from God in the form and from what she called the living light. And she wrote music and she created compendiums of healing remedies and of her visions and revelations. And she had volumes of correspondence with significant religious and political figures during her time. And in Hildegard's life, she had been 
prophetic and she'd had visionary experiences from a very early age, but she was also a very sickly child. And so her family admitted her to a monastery when she was eight. And she didn't realize that the visions that she was having had any kind of divine source until she had a life-changing mystical experience when she was 43. And so she considered herself unlearned and ignorant. And even though she came from an aristocratic family, she was still a woman. And so she wasn't entitled to and did not receive a formal education. However, she had an extraordinary life. <laughs> and she wrote three volumes of books, which contain her vast and complex theological concepts that came from the visions and revelations. And these were also the sources of her music. And the visions that we'll look at shortly are from two of her volumes. So here, we'll let Hildegard speak to us in her own words. And you'll see that the divine fire is a thread that runs through her work. This segment here is from her first public declaration of her visions. She says, heaven was opened and a fiery light of exceeding brilliance came and permeated my whole brain and inflamed my whole heart and my whole breast, not like a burning, but like a warming flame, a warming flame. As the sun warms anything, its rays touch. And immediately I knew the meaning of the exposition of the scriptures. Though I did not have the interpretation of the words of their texts, or the division of the syllables, or the knowledge of cases or tenses. But I had sensed in myself wonderfully the power and mystery of secret and admirable visions from my childhood. I heard a voice from heaven saying, I am the living light who illuminates the darkness. And this image, which is a beautiful illumination, and the illuminations were created in the monastery. And so the some of the sisters in the monastery were artists and they did her illuminations. And so this is a portrait of Hildegard in her room receiving the divine light and fire. And you see a monk there on the right side. And that monk, his name is Volmar, and he was her secretary and confessor. And he assisted her in, in writing. And the living light told Hildegard to work with Volmar in great zeal so that the living light's hidden miracles might be revealed because Volmar helped to translate and make the writing smooth for presenting to the public. So one of the visions one of the first visions that she has in her first volume called Scivius, Know the Ways, is this version of a universe model. So this is her vision of what the universe is conceived of and looked like. So I'll read this. She said, I saw a vast instrument, round and shadowed, in the shape of an egg. Surrounding its circumference, there was a bright fire with, as it were, a shadowy zone underneath it. And in that fire, there was a globe of sparkling flame, so great that the whole instrument was illuminated by it, over which three little torches were arranged in such a way that by their fire, they held up the globe lest it fall. And that globe at times raised itself up so that much fire flew to it and came to it so that its flames were more quickly subdued. But from the fire that surrounded the instrument issued a blast with whirlwinds, which diffused themselves hither and thither throughout the instrument. In that zone too, there was a dark fire of such horror that I could not look at it, whose force shook the whole zone, 
full of thunder, tempest, and exceedingly sharp stones, both large and small. And while it made its thunders heard, the bright fire and the winds and the air were in commotion, so that lightning preceded those thunders, for the fire felt within itself the turbulence of the thunder. And so here we have the image and we'll go through it a bit and look at the different types of fire. But also I think one really amazing thing about this illumination is that it looks very modern. It looks like it could have been produced this century. Um, so it's, it's humbling for me to, to look at it and know that it was made in the 12th century. And there's um, an author, Sarah Salvadori, who creates these beautiful volumes of Hildegard's visions, and she helps to break down what some of the elements mean. So I have pulled out some of these, and so we'll look at some of these elements now. So the, if you look at the image, the big orangey outline around the egg figure, <clears throat> that's called lucid fire. And that fire represents faith and the lack of faith. And Hildegard deals with all kinds of different fire. There's not just one type of fire. There's a huge variety of fire in her visions. And so here you see in the middle, earth and humanity. And then in the blue, where the stars are, that's the dark fire. And she sees that as traps of the ancient enemy. And then again, at the bottom, Again, all around, we have the lucid fire, the fire of faith or lack of faith. And then at the very top, we have three little flames. That represents the Trinity. And then we have this big flame right in the middle of the top, the glowing fire. And that is representative of the sun. And also she sees that as Christ. And then a bit further down, you see what's called the incandescent fire. And that's the fire of the moon, which she sees as a church. And again, with the, the modernity of this image, I was thinking, gosh, that looks like something that could be um, created, could have been created in the 70s as part of the feminist art movement because it looks very feminine. And I thought, gosh, that looks like something that should be in Judy Chicago's art, right, for the, the dinner party. And the Grandmaster has talked about the dinner party quite a few times. And so I went and looked up the dinner party and how Hildegard was represented. And sure enough, Judy Chicago did re represent this Hildegard version of the cosmic egg as her um, table setting at the dinner party. And this was in the 70s. And much of Hildegard's theology was very feminine centric. And in fact, she had a number of characters that she gave names to from her visions and they represented different aspects of divinity. And she really believed in the power of the feminine to nurture and love and create abundance throughout the universe. And she used a term called veriditas to represent what she called a greening effect on creation. So this represents the fertile, overflowing, lush, abundant aspect of creation. And in her cosmology, she named a trinity of divine feminine aspects. And there's an author, Nancy Fierro, that talks about this in a wonderful volume on Hildegard and the feminine. And she calls these out Hildegard does as Lady Wisdom, Mother Earth, and the one we'll look at now. Her name is Caritas, and this means divine love. And sometimes Hildegard will refer to her as Lady Love. And Caritas says, I, the highest in fiery power, have kindled every spark of life. I decide on all reality. With wisdom, I have rightly put the universe in order. 
I, the fiery life of divine essence, am a flame beyond the beauty of the meadows. I gleam in the waters and I burn in the sun, moon, and stars. And thus, I remain hidden in every kind of reality as a fiery power. So Caritas is this divine fiery love that permeates creation. And like we saw in Pasquale's work, she keeps creation in equilibrium. And here in this figure, in this, the illumination here, you see the figure of Caritas and you'll see that she's red. She's red and orange because she's fire. And she's underneath uh, the Christ figure. And down, if you look at the bottom right of the image, you'll see a little opening in the frame. And that leads to this image on the left. And that is an image, again, of Hildegard receiving the vision through the fiery light. And this is a trope, an illustrative device that's used frequently in her illuminations of her visions to represent the fact that the vision is coming to her. And so we have. The in the Caritas image here, we have the divine word and then divine love, and then coming down to Hildegard. So now let's look at Caritas in action. So here, this is another illumination from the same series of visions. And <clears throat> here we have the universe. This is a new version of a different vision of Hildegard's vision and revelations of how the universe is constructed. And so here is a representation of the universe with humanity in the middle. And this is what she says. Divinity is like a wheel, whole and utterly undivided, for it has neither beginning nor ending, nor can anything grasp or surround it for it is outside of time. And when Hildegard had this vision, she also had a concept of a new meaning of human connected to the image of God. And the vision said, for God created the world, which he wished to prepare as a tabernacle for man. And because it was his will, that he should be clothed in humankind, he made man in his own image and likeness. I determined my every activity in my son, the seventh day. My son, who is my seventh work, proceeding from the virgin's womb through humanity, accomplished all things with me in the Holy Spirit. And so if we look at the different sections in this illumination, we're able to see how all this is related together. And so here we have the figure of Caritas, divine fiery love, and she's surrounding the universe. So you can see that her whole breast and abdomen have expanded to hold the universe in this wheel. And right underneath her neck are the sun and the moon. And then we have the lucid fire, again, that surrounds the universe. And that is her divine fiery love. We have the human being in the middle. And then there's the path of the sun. If you see the gold line going right across the middle of the image, that line is the path of the sun. And that represents the faithful person going through life, the faithful person also opposing injustice. Some of the um, other imagery, the lofty clouds represent people who follow the saints and the stars and keep their minds pure. And this is in Hildegard's vision description. And the low clouds, the low clouds represent humans who yield to bodily needs only and have clouded minds and they bring rains and tears. And the globe is in the center, the globe is the earth. And this is tempered by elements. This is man tempered by elements, um, like having an active life, 
with appropriate desires, right desires, she says, and being kept steady by devotion, discernment, and discretion. And underneath the earth here in the, the blue surrounding, that she calls dark fire, which she calls judgment. And one other note, <clears throat> excuse me, about the luminaries of the sun and moon are that they make the firmament of the universe steady. And those are also representative of the knowledge of good and evil. And so she really talks a lot here about um, the relationship of man and how the whole universe is constructed. And there's a lot more depth to it. And I definitely um, encourage anyone who's interested to go more in depth in looking at what all of the visions and the symbols mean. It's very complex to read Hildegard's visions and revelations. And so to really, really get into it and relish it, it takes some time. You have to spend some time diving into it. And so um, <clears throat> um, next we'll move on here. And I wanted to show you a detail from this illumination so that you can see how rich it is. It might be hard to see when it appears small on the screen, but here we have it much larger and you can see the Caritas's sleeves with this orangey gold color and then the fire, the fire that she is in this big circle. And you can see the stars going across with their different rays. And then you see the sun and the moon directly under her throat. So why talk about Pasquale and Hildegard today? And I think this is um, important to think about because in the beginning, I talked about the wake-up call. And I talked about paying attention and staying awake and being present and engaged in our lives. And if we go back and think about Greek mythology, when Prometheus gave fire to people, humanity took an evolutionary leap forward. And today, if we can be in a state of awakeness in our lives, <clears throat> excuse me, and live in the present now and co-create with this spiritual fire that we've seen examples of, I think we can take an evolutionary leap in consciousness and beingness. And looking at these different models of the divine fire, we see ways of allowing ourselves to be conscious conduits of that divine fire that surrounds us. And so when we look at Hildegard and Pasquale, why are they important today and what do they offer us? Well, they both created models where they discuss the power of the divine fire to create, love, and sustain the world, as well as physically and spiritually nourish and inspire us, its inhabitants. And I think they both demand that we approach their work with both our left and right brains, with our whole spectrum of attention. And both of their works are rich in symbolism, imagination, theology, esoteric and mystical knowledge and intuition. And it's very different than work that's done today. You don't really see this kind of work anymore. And both of these mystics have messages for us today about humanity's special place in creation. And that in order to fulfill our cosmic mission, we must relish the fullness, beauty, and beneficial use of the creativity of our humanity. And for instance, you may have noticed that one of the themes in the treatise on the reintegration of beings was that both the spiritual beings and humans that were cast out of the celestial realms and the divine realms, they lost their privileged spiritual positions in the immensities with divinity when they misuse their ability, their gift of creation. 
And this in itself is worth significant contemplation for modern times today. And I think another one of the messages from Hildegard and from Pasquale is to wake up to this divine fire and seize it in our lives. <clears throat> and so how do we look at doing this today? Well, there are many practices that we can use to create more contact with our inner selves and open up space. The author Nancy Fierro that I referenced before writes that Hildegard was able to create an inner spaciousness in her life from which to receive her divine inspirations and create her vast compendium of work. And as a Benedictine nun, she did this through fasting, prayer, silence, and work routine. And but I think in general, we also see that Hildegard had her own internal fire that kept feeding her visions and revelations and her body of creative work. And we can be inspired by that. We can also use her as an example and use ourselves with some of our practices to carve out that spaciousness of our own. And so some of those things might be to do the concentration exercises that we have in our monographs, to engage in a creative process and practice, to do regular meditation and prayer. And in Martinism, for instance, there's a particular emphasis placed on meditation, prayer, and silence. In the Rosicrucian order, there's an emphasis placed on meditation and spiritual exercises. We can also look to help others. And there are other ways we can think of to invite our inner selves into a deeper relationship to engage that divine fire. Or maybe we could just be more present in our relationships with others. Another way is to bring in love and assist others with seeking their passion and potential. And by extension, we can use this model to consciously reach for our own contact with that divine fire. It's always there. <laughs> the fire is always there. And we have to open ourselves up to, to receive it sometimes. And I think um, we talked about bringing in love and helping others and helping others really come to their full potential. Um, often when we give something that we would like, we receive it in and of ourselves. And I think these actions can help us reorient ourselves to bring in peace, balance, and perhaps a new renaissance to humanity. And so as we end, I present here a prayer from Louis Claude de Saint Martin, where he talks about being with the divine fire and becoming a new person. And so, if you could sit comfortably, I invite everyone to sit comfortably and take in a deep breath and close your eyes. And I'll read the prayer. And then we'll have a musical piece with which to reflect on and integrate the prayer. Eternal source of all that is. Send to the one who seeks to find you a spirit of truth to reconcile forever with you. May the fire of this spirit consume in me all traces of the old being. And after the consummation, may you make out of this pile of embers a new being upon whom your sacred hand will pour the holy anointing without disdain. 
May this be the end of long works of penitence, and may your life, universally one, transform my entire being into the unity of your image. My heart into the unity of your love. My action into one unity of the works of justice. And my thought into one unity of lights. Abolish the region of images for me. Dissipate its fantastic barriers that impose an immense distance and thick obscurity between your living light and myself, and which overshadow me with their darkness. Draw near me the sacred character and the divine seal of which you are the guardian, and convey unto the breast of my soul the fire that burns within you, in order that it may burn with you, and that it may feel some of your unutterable life and the inexhaustible delight of your eternal existence. Thank you, Frauders and Sororas, for joining us today. Peace profound. <laughs>